Hello, everyone. This is Dark Journalist with an exclusive interview with esoteric researcher and intuitive coach Gigi Young on UFO consciousness and mystery school revelations. Gigi, it's great to see you. Oh, thank you for having me back. Um, you, back in December, were covering a lot of the mysterious things that were happening that we were seeing uh, going on. For example, the Israeli space uh, chief who came out and who was retired and said, actually, we have a base on Mars and there are aliens watching us and we have deals with them not to disclose that. Trump wanted to disclose it when he was president, but they said, no, you know, don't do it. Um, unusual stories like this now seem almost commonplace. And you've been starting to develop analysis along the lines of they're trying to prepare us uh, for something, but it's on their terms and with their narrative. Oh, absolutely. December was a really big month for this quiet disclosure that was going on. We had that Hamashad who came forward with that sort of announcement. It was, it was information that we all knew that whistleblowers have been saying for years, but he just kind of came out and just beat the drum for a while and then kind of retracted a lot of it later. But it stayed in the media for a good three weeks in its entire narrative. And then they started kind of walking things back a little bit after they probably gathered their data or whatever. And then we have this really bizarre scene with the Vatican, the Vatican nativity scene. Yes. So they roll out the Vatican nativity scene and it's the most bizarre thing anybody's ever seen. It's literally like, you know, here's like a kind of like a stone baby Jesus and he has like a red towel thrown over him because he's in the womb. And then you have what looks like a, a skull helmet on another one. And then you have what looks like an astronaut with the, with the hat and the tubing and everything. And so everybody was saying it was, you know, the Christmas astronaut and it got really weird there. There were a couple more things that happened. The monolith happened as well. Yes. And so December was a really, really huge time. We didn't really notice it though. We didn't notice that there was all of these little things going on because we were so focused on the election and politics and, 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 and COVID that we just sort of were taking in all of this space information and all of this disclosure information. We were just accepting it, just kind of taking it in. And I think that's one of the biggest themes that we're not really talking about enough is the reality that there's so much space and disclosure stuff going on behind the scenes that if we didn't have COVID-19 and we didn't have an election, we would be going on and on and on about how fast this is moving, yeah. including, you know, Musk's rocket launches and, and increasing talks about colonizing Mars and moving towards Mars. Um, it's just, there's this huge space rush and disclosure rush that is totally paralleling all of this, um, more mundane level of drama, which is important, like with the election, COVID-19, but right behind the scenes, disclosure is nipping at its heels. And what is happening is, is that we're getting more and more conditioned into thinking about things in a certain way. And then there will come a time where that disclosure narrative comes forward. It will come forward. And why this is so significant for all of us to understand is that it has the potential to supplant the culture that we have now. We think that having uh, an, an election that wasn't um, orchestrated properly is a big deal. Now we're talking about actually potentially getting rid of that system entirely because we're exposed to so much advanced technology and a new spiritual paradigm because there's these crazy ETs that could come forward or savior elements could come forward and, and, and affect religion at that point. It kind of um, has this potential to supplant everything that we know and everything that we have now very, very, very quickly. And that's why we have to keep talking about this and, and taking this narrative back, asking the right questions, and even going into, as you've called it on your show, deep consciousness studies so that we can discern and understand and be ready for these very large conversations that we're almost being hypnotically induced for through various stages of trauma, through politics, and also the medical tyranny that we're experiencing. Wow, yeah, that's really, there's this incredible, like, 
video game mentality around all of these uh, UFO disclosure things. And you saw all those groups on Twitter and other places just going around and treating it like it was some kind of a video game where they needed to guess the characters. Oh, I know. I, I see. I, it's a really good example. I just see that. And I, and I, it's like, we're so unprepared. Yes. We don't know how to deal with it. We don't know how to process this because the, the development of our space technology and our advanced technology has been privatized. And so, you know, we, we went to the moon and then all of that technology just conveniently disappears or we, you know, whether we went to the moon or not, that was the narrative, right? And then suddenly it disappears and it's privatized. And so there's one group or a few groups that have all of this information that I've been doing it for, for what, 60, 70 years, more than that, maybe. And then the rest of society is woefully behind and has no idea what to do with it because the only times they ever interact, their brain with this information is through movies or through video games. And so that's what they respond with is they have no um exposure to it really otherwise you know because it's been purposefully hidden so that it can be perhaps shockingly revealed right absolutely and uh we get into a whole trivial thing about it even the monoliths which was that big story that was breaking and you and i talked about and, and have over the past couple of years the idea of false monuments being planted to be discovered to give us this whole backstory that doesn't exist. Uh, whereas the mystery school tradition gives us that whole Atlantean Lemurian story. And that's supported by so much of, you know, ancient Egyptian art and, and the Mayan records and all the rest. But this was almost like, um, let's create a false, you know, just like they have the false alien thing. Oh, there's a false alien threat. There's a UFO threat. We need all this funding to deal with these aliens. Um, it seems to me that now they're playing around with a couple of different things. You know, they're playing around with the idea, uh, as you've said before, of kind of like fake Atlantean disclosure. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because I think that that's actually really how we have to view. There's several different corrections, I would say, that maybe we need to take in regards to viewing ETs. Um, and one is to begin to see them as interdimensionals. Right. So these are interdimensional beings. They're not necessarily even from a different planet or the planet that they're from is not necessarily completely separate or different than Earth. They're actually shifting different dimensions and they're shifting through time. This is a very, very important thing that we have to grasp because right now we're seeing this idea that ETs are external from some kind of faraway world. And this really takes our power away. And this is part of the false disclosure narrative, which is to think that there are, is, is to kind of take away our history from us. And it's not clear that they don't actually believe these things themselves and that they probably believe these things themselves and they're maybe misinformed, but we have had high cultures on earth before many, many, many high cultures on earth before. And um, we, yes. Yes, and you've talked about this with um, Edgar Casey's work, which is the most prolific psychic to date on Atlantis. Um, he talks about, you know, UFOs moving through walls and going under the sea and connecting with this collective crystalline technology that is harnessed by the sun. And, um, and so we have to realize that that's us. That's not, this technology is human. And right. it's connected to our earth and it's connected to us. And so what happens is we start to see this really kind of disclosure narrative, but it's kind of really an Atlantean narrative, mm -hmm. really. If we really, really think about it, it really is kind of, it's kind of just the disclosure of Atlantis. Right. And um, so that's a really good way to think of it. The other thing about Atlantis that ties into the monoliths that we were just talking about is Atlantis used a um, obelisk monolith system for their power grid, their sort of psychic power grid that they used. Um, it has 
been carried through many different temple cultures over time. And it has to do with obviously positive, negative, um, and the phallus and the pools. It's the same temple principle that we see over and over and over again. And so when we see a monolith appear, we can laugh about it and we can say, this is a hoax or this is a prank or like, this is funny. But what we're really seeing is we're seeing an ancient technology. It's no different than seeing um, a, a more modern technology being revealed. It's, it, it's you know, even the, even the energy of stones, as we know um, with um, pyramids and whatnot are extremely powerful. Um, and uh, so all of these monoliths popping up we have to understand that this is a, a technology, it's a spiritual technology, and it is an Atlantean Lemurian spiritual technology and a vestige really of our history. Yes. Oh, that's a really good point, actually. And the the monoliths are almost like representative. What I the first one of the things that bothered me about them and their frequent reports that came out all of a sudden uh, is that the media loved these stories so much. You know, the media loves to hide anything that's important. So the fact that they were really into it, I knew that they were promoting it as part of the, hey, think about this instead, you know? True. Um, there is the whole story about Buzz Aldrin and um, how he was saying that, you know, they found one of these monoliths on Phobos, which is one of the moons of Mars. So um, he went on the record with it and then, you know, it was one of those things where people panicked when he said it, <laughs> but he was aware of it. And um, so this is definitely something that's operational. Recently, they let out some of Tesla's, um, it wasn't his papers scientifically, it was just him talking about experiences that he had. And one of the things he was talking about was getting this series of communications from Mars uh, in the late 1899 uh, period. And he said, you know, it was remarkable to me because when the signals were coming in, I knew that they were conscious, intelligently controlled signals. And it scared me because I thought I'm the only person communicating with aliens. But who was on Mars sending him signals at that time? Right. And people thought exactly. And he, um, he was certain they were from Mars. Somehow he was able to nail it down, you know, that, that it was from Mars. And... I think Tesla had a lot of esoteric knowledge. And I think that that is really what drove Nikola Tesla. Um, and one of the things I think that we may also need to correct our perspective or flip it into a, an esoteric perspective to understand space is that planets just aren't rock. They're just not kind of like these randomly formed pieces of rock or minerals that you can just kind of mine or you know do whatever you want with who knows the mystery it's not it's a mystery but it's not so mysterious because every planet has um a distinct connection with earth um and each other and they represent a specific time in humanity so so mars represents Mars is not just a planet, it represents a certain level of consciousness in humanity, but also a certain time of humanity. And you could also take it a little bit further and say that there's an aspect of ourself that is pinging with Mars, that is stored in Mars. And there's, this is also the same with Venus and with Jupiter. And we can see this in Steiner's work when he aligns the different spheres in order. You know, why, why would he do that? Or why would theosophists align them in a specific order like that? Why not just randomly put them wherever you want? Well, because they represent certain phases of consciousness. And that doesn't just disappear because we're seeing them in a physical form. It just doesn't exist in the higher realms. And so when we see people, yeah, so it's, um, there's, there's a whole, um, and even you could even look at it this way. Every single planet exists within our, within ourselves. There is an aspect of ourselves that is that planet. And when we are doing psychic work, when a psychic is doing psychic work, they are pinging with those planets. And some psychics will ping more with Mars or whatever, they'll bypass them entirely and have a different perspective on Mars. It depends on what your relationship is with that planet right. and that energy, which would be related to past lives, future lives. It gets very esoteric because time disappears, right? 
But to make a long esoteric story short, these are extremely powerful bodies that when when Tesla was communicating with it, he, he, he knew that Mars was a very specific place in the psychic circuitry of humanity. He knew that and he understood um, that it was a specific time in humanity as well. And so he was using the circuitry of the stars and I believe that's why he also received Mars first um, is because there are certain energies that are more relevant to us because of certain energies that the earth is holding now through resonance. And so I think he, I, th I think he maybe knew a little bit more about that than he was saying. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's fascinating. You and I did a classic X series episode on the Steiner planetary seals. Yes. Uh, and Steiner discussed in depth how the, uh, in occult literature, they had switched Mercury with Venus and that the switch took place somewhere around the ninth century. But if you went back before that, then what we would know as Venus was actually Mercury. So, um, the setup of the planets is actually a mystery to us. We understand them from a physical standpoint to a certain degree, the gravitational movements and things of this nature. But the deeper esoteric principle for why, for example, uh, a mystery school would make large scale moves to prevent the ordinary society and scientific minds from knowing that Mercury was actually Venus and Venus was Mercury. Um, what does that tell us about the kind of system that is actually in operation around them? Um, the esoteric system or the or the political? I would think the esoteric system, yeah. Yeah, well, um, the esoteric system is always evolving and changing just like we are. Right. You know, um, and so in, in Steiner's um, work, um, Cosmic Memory, he also talks about the... Um, appearance of the sun and the moon and, and how planets actually form and, and kind of come into being. And we don't think of, we don't think of planets like that. We think that they're just there and they've always been there. Yes. And this kind of also leans a little bit into Velikovsky and his world in chaos, which he got in a lot of trouble for. Um, right. and yeah. yeah. And um, when we realize that. From the scientific community. From the scientific community, they did not want to think that maybe us and the planets are in one big evolutionary phase together growing together and the planets are actually storing data and information right alongside of us as we grow and they swing into times of life and they swing out of life um and um we don't realize how totally interlaced we are with the cosmos and and that the sun will change again and a new spectrum of light will come and we will have a different sun and um, a, and, uh, and new planets will form. And our, our materialist perspective has divorced us from looking at things in this long form. But if we're going to become a spacefaring culture and we're going to start directly interacting with these planets, maybe we should know um exactly what they represent to us because it's incredibly deep they're the structures that actually also vibrationally hold reality together you know so absolutely uh the we were very well aware of the fact that the ancient cultures and their spiritual teachers revered places where uh comets would hit and as a matter of fact uh, some of the really famous things like the Serpent Mound in Ohio and other sacred stone sites are on these magnetic lines. And the reason those lines are there is because of these comets uh, have hit. What kind of a correlation is that? I mean, is it a kind of a holy experience when a comet collides with Earth? Oh, and yeah. Earth? yeah. Oh, it's absolutely a holy experience. It's a, it's a whole new idea. It's a whole new concept coming in. It could even represent a being coming in or a certain consciousness of beings coming in. Um, it's it's a very big deal. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. And well, even I think, I think Mecca. Is Mecca yeah. not yes. a comet? An asteroid, yes. And they like call it Venus. I can't remember if, if, if that's the one, if it's Mecca or not, but they collect these comets and it's 
a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely. Feminine. They're often magnetic and yeah. Well, and the Mayans worshipped, you know, these things. What we see in the past two years is this incredible uh, proliferation of fireballs <laughs> and uh, heavily concentrated in that hot zone area around Puerto Rico to Venezuela, you know, really seeing incredible activity there. And a lot of them surviving to the point where they actually crash intact and cause fires, whereas they usually burn up in the atmosphere. Uh, we know one recently, just a couple of years ago in Russia took place uh, where it came in at such a magnitude that had it actually struck the ground, it would have been like setting off five nukes. So these things are happening and um, it seems like they're just in the flow of things. Like, you know, we hear about this fireball, that fireball, but the incredible uptick of activity, um, what I'm trying to piece together on this is, do these people who are, you know, like the kind of World Economic Forum types, those who are trying to control the world now and uh, do the whole lockdown thing with COVID and, and put in this DNA experimental <laughs> vaccine on everybody. You know, these people know a lot about deep space. And do they know that something is coming in here? And are, are they setting themselves up by already kind of putting the population into this kind of almost enslavement lockdown? Because they know that these changes are coming in and they want to, when those changes hit, they just want to be well positioned. I, they know that something's coming. There's there, there, there's no question. There's been so much coordination, so many plans, so many like run throughs of various different things. So many CEOs stepping down, land being purchased, all these different projects. There's been so much going go, going on with these globalist types that it's clear that something's going on, um, or that they believe that something's going on. Um, and it's also, we're also living in a highly prophesied time. You know, the, the Bible talks about this. So many psychics have come forward and pinned this time as being an extremely significant time for humanity. And I think that the, the thing about, I think, the globalist types is they're very fear oriented, I would say. It's all about might is right. Clearly, they're wanting to own everything while we can just have nothing and be happy. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, and so they're oh, not- lose ownership of everything. What a great Yeah. Idea. Like, they're uh -huh. just wanting- Yeah, basically, that's basically slavery, let's be honest, and call it for what it is. If you want to own something, you should be able to own it. You know, one guy just, like, Scrooge McDuck just hoards everything in his house and then just gives it to you if you're good. Like, this is ridiculous. But the, so these people are not for humanity. That's not a loving thing to do. Right. Not loving to hoard all of the resources of the world and then dole it out, you know? Um, and so this does not, why this is significant, why the condition of their consciousness being might is right and survival of the fittest is significant is because it doesn't line them up for getting very accurate information about the future. So basically, yeah, you have, and if you want to, in the time of the quickening, which we are in, in which more cosmic light is, you know, coming to the earth, um, we had the Jupiter Saturn conjunction, which created a very strong Christ consciousness the, uh, stream for oh, humanity. Yes. Yeah. And so we have this Christ consciousness returning and coming back in full force. And if you are looking at that psychically, even if you're using technology and you are of a low vibrational frequency, you are going to see your own destruction and you are going to see destruction and you are going to see very negative things or very dark things because you're going to see yourself reflected back to you because that's pretty much what psychic work is. If you want to get beyond the astral plane, you have to get beyond the mirror realm. You know, that's with Alice going into the mirror. You have to be able to get through your image yourself. Right. And they're not, if you're in that consciousness, you're not even close to that. So I think that they're looking psychically and they're using various technologies to maybe see, and they're seeing something that's quite disastrous or that's quite scary. But I would also add 
that you know the average person as they receive this energy and this christ consciousness that may not be what's authentically true right so we can't just yes. automatically assume that whatever the um the sort of darker factions in the world see is is going to be automatically what is true for us it's just not the case there are two very distinct consciousnesses forming on the planet today um and they are going to have different futures they're going to have different realities like we've, we've spoken about rudolf steiner and the eighth sphere and that lower world that is created and then the upper world which is also in the hopi prophecy of the two paths everywhere and so we can't automatically assume that um what they are seeing is what will happen to us we don't have a shared future in that sense we we we, we do in a way in this life but there's also a level of this where there is a splitting of timelines well this is interesting because um steiner in talking about new jupiter and the evolutionary step that is supposed to take place the the idea of the eighth sphere as this artificial realm, an artificial step in our evolution, that Armon, uh, this, you know, kind of negative entity that Steiner identifies, which is basically the devil, um, but very active through technology in the 21st century, sets up this artificial evolutionary track in the eighth sphere. But what's supposed to happen is actually a new Jupiter, which is the new Earth. Uh, in essence, that's in development. And then the soul wave is moving toward that. That's the natural uh, step. And in the middle of all that, Steiner talks about something called a bitter moon, oh. where those entities that try to take possession, basically, of the human race and mine it, and the individuals that they're able to suck in, go off and they are this part of this evolutionary chain of this bitter moon. So that is very interesting because it's a very cosmological take on this split. But you're talking about this split taking place on Earth, and it sounds very similar. It's like the inverted reflection of the same thing. Yeah, well, for me, you know, it's there's a bunch of different prophecies and different esoterica and different, different technology that I have a different... Um, I guess prophecies or takes that basically say the same thing. It's always about these two paths. One is direct, um, which may be the soul stream kind of eventually forming to Jupiter. Like it's not going to be tomorrow or anything like that. You know, we're we're gradually moving there. And then there's also this divergent stream where it's almost like people don't um, pass the initiation. It's almost like to get to Jupiter, what Steiner would call New Jupiter what some would call 5D Earth, you have to pass the initiation. Um, and then if you don't pass, you go into like an artificial realm. And it's artificial because it's not organic. It's, you've created it. You've, you're playing God. There's a, we have to be very careful with how we create things in this life. We have to align with God and with um, our higher self to a certain degree. And then we create from there. That is the perfect balance between, you know, aligning with with our higher self and then serving the planet or or, or creating it's it, it's a balance but when you just create from ego it's synthetic it's artificial there's not enough actual raw spiritual impulse in it to connect you back up with your higher stream and so therefore whenever we create from our ego from that lower form or the beast system as some would call it it's not real it's not it's it's synthetic and that's why people are also people that tend to do that will be drawn into things like transhumanism is because they still desire very much to have the natural organic awakening of getting your intuition back and all these amazing things happening. But they know they can't get it because they haven't been creating in their life properly. So they synthetically create it. It's just playing God. And that's why it's artificial um, is that it's not connected with that original pulse that makes everything holy. And um, so if it's not holy, it's artificial, it's inverted. Um, and that is what that sphere, um, when I look at it, is, is all about. And the moon is key because the moon acts like a key. 
it acts like a um, lock and key. The the its vibrational frequency and its cycling for consciousness acts like a key, in which the moon contains all of our pain and all of our trauma, and um, it it holds it there so that we can work on it, so that we can heal ourselves. It's functional. It's not evil. It, it's serving us. It's serving a a function for us. Um, it's neutral. And we can't actually leave this realm unless we look at what we have left in the moon to work on. So that's why it's kind of like a lock. It will lock you here if you are not working on yourself. And that's why people say it's a prison planet. Well, yeah, it is going to be a prison planet if you refuse to work on yourself, if you refuse to develop. The moon will lock you here. Certainly it will. I mean, it's not really the moon. It's it's the because remember, all planets are also inside of us, right? So it, what it, it's locking you off from taking on higher frequencies that would probably just fry your brain, or that would probably actually harm you or cause madness, really. Right. So You're not ready for those higher <laughs> not states? Ready. Yeah. You know, it's they're extremely harmonic, and it's it's incredibly painful to experience spiritual power that you're not ready for. So, so then the, the question becomes, how do you prepare? How do you get ready? I feel that the uh, mystery school cosmology UFO side now is more important than ever because what people need to to, and this is what I'll ask you next, which is what people need to do, I think, is go inside, go within now. Um, that's where it's at because the aftermath is all this stuff has happened on the outside. And like, so the deep kind of um, taking stock has to take place inside. Yes. Like the side comes back in. Yeah. And there's a really interesting thing that happens when we go inside um, is that if, if we can all go inside and start doing that inner work and going into our heart what ends up happening is a completely different momentum starts to be created within humanity. And what happens is that politicians and leaders start realizing that you're not looking for them to solve your problems anymore because you're kind of getting good at doing that yourself. You're kind of getting better. You're, you're kind of seeing that relationship between the inner world and the outer world and the collective conscious, the collective consciousness that we all share is starting to become something that maybe we're thinking about and maybe asking questions like, well, how do we shift the collective consciousness? If this exists, is this not our point of power? And how do we shift that? How do we tap into that? And this is why one of the reasons why they don't want people to gather in groups too, because one of the things about shifting the collective consciousness um, is that we have to be in groups, you know, that really, we don't have to be, but it really does speed it up and it really does help. Um, so when we start catching on to these things, which really are in the spiritual realm, a little bit beyond philosophy, it really is, it, it really is a spiritual experience. Then we see that politicians start realizing, uh-oh, we better start listening to them and we better see what they want. And this starts to get into a whole different kind of leadership when you have a spiritually evolving, spiritually awakened um, population is leadership completely changes when there's that spirituality involved. Well, we have a backwards curve happening with leadership right now. Um, and, you know, I would say that we had with the populist movement, putting Trump in there, the shake them out thing of, you know, let's say what's on our minds. And there was a lot of that that came forward. And then like the empire strikes back, they install Biden and they install this whole system. And it's almost like the leadership thing is now it's back in that weird position where it's, it's a backward they're leading us in a backwards fashion. Um, so when we go out and we look at what's at stake, say for 2021, um, how do you take it from a point of view of, I'm gonna go within in the aftermath of all this and all the things that have played out to really get informed and to really hear that message about what the next steps are? Yeah, what, what I would start by just unplugging. Yes. And just get off of social media. <laughs> um, 
you know, there's that sense of urgency all the time with social media. There's always something happening that's a really big deal that you have to know. And we have to get over the idea that, you know, we're going to be uninformed if we don't watch the news or we're going to be uninformed if we don't turn on social media every five minutes. Um, and we have to realize that we are the most informed when we are actually informed about what's going on within ourselves, emotionally, mentally, all of that. That is the first thing that we need to function on, to, to think about. And then only once we have that kind of stabilized and we, and, and we feel like we're in um, more harmony, should we then go out and look at the world. And from that place, we have a very different, even if you just took, it's so dramatic that most people, if they just take five minutes and go sit in a quiet room and just breathe and just let go, or just go walk somewhere without their shoes on, and then they come back to the same thing, they often don't even see it the same way, or the interest towards it's completely gone. And so this is the kind, it's along those lines where we have to start developing that power within um, so that we have more control over the material world than, than we do now. Because right now, as you said, the, going backwards in this is that we're all, we're being sucked into narratives. We're being sucked into things because we're not sovereign enough to right. not get sucked in. There's something that we're not getting, which is that we're not understanding that we're a sovereign entity, um, a sovereign being um, that is part of God, right? We're, we're not understanding we're getting sucked into all these different things as though our individuality and our sovereignty just doesn't matter. It doesn't exist. Right. Right. Absolutely. And uh, they're trying to peg people off, you know, into, oh, they're white supremacists, you know. Um, oh, they're misinformation people. Anytime for, you know, regardless of what you say, you have to be lobbed into some category for them to tabulate you and be able to ship you off <laughs> so that you can't have any independent, uh, you know, ideas or ex expressed. Now, what's interesting to me is, and we've talked about the setup in society and how the mystery schools and the secret societies, left hand and right hand, are interwoven throughout the political process. And so they've set up a kind of a paradigm in society where they're, they're battling against each other for the ability to move the culture in one direction or the other. And we know that one of those directions would be pretty perilous <laughs> for people on earth. Um, the mystery school setup, they seem to understand the UFO question was going to come into the fore. As a matter of fact, some of the very key people uh, like George Adamski, who were the big contactee space brother, fifties uh, Orthon contacted me in the desert. Um, were very, very deep theosophists. And his first book um, came out paired back to back with the top theosophist, Desmond Leslie, in the UK as a single book. Leslie wrote one book about theosophy and Adamski wrote a book called About the Space Brothers, and they put those two books out uh, together. So there's a direct tie over now with the mystery schools into the space brother alien thing what is the message behind that? Because that seemed to be something that was organic that was happening before all this monkey business uh, started with the government interfering with the alien there. Well, we've, it is very interesting. It's um, well, you know, there are, there are groups of people who never ever lost contact with what we would call space brothers. And the space sisters right we never lost contact and um you could look at them as atlanteans you could look venusians pleiadians there's lots of different kind of wording that is is used but there are certain groups on this planet that never lost contact with humanity they never left humanity they just sort of recessed um in their influence because they essentially have different rules of engagement a high society is, has completely different rules of engagement than a society that is dark and a group that is dark. And um, um, you could also, if we wanted to modernize it a little bit more, even the Adamski story and maybe even what theosophy was building up to, 
um, is that there are different breakaway civilizations. And people talk about breakaway civilizations. I think we automatically start thinking of negative things and we get into, and we start spiraling into the whole like prison planet thing. And we think about these Nazis and this is a very important part of the breakaway civilization conversation. There's no question there. That's something that we need to get into and, and, and discuss, but there's also a positive breakaway civilization. There's also a, um, one that serves humanity. There are both, there are two. And this is a very important conversation to have because so many times when we do look at this modern conversation, as you've pointed out, you know, it becomes like this threat narrative where everything's a threat or it starts to get very warped very fast. And there's very little conversations about, um, or there's very little comparing and contrasting the, um, the two different breakaway civilizations that coexist on this planet that have different people engaged in them. Um, and Let's working do a with quick, them. what would be a quick description of breakaway civilization A, breakaway civilization B? We know uh, about one of the breakaways that it involves working on advanced technology to kind of ex protect type people. And they have taken it to a point where they're like, we're not going to share this with the public. We don't want to move the culture forward. We just want to develop the stuff on our own. That would be one track. What about yeah. the other one? Well, yes. The 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 other one um, has completely different rules of engagement. They're completely different. They want, um, they see humanity as being in a time of deep initiation. And they don't interfere with humanity as much as some people may like because they see humanity as needing to ex to experience this and kind of go through this initiation um whereas the darker um more self-serving side sees this as an opportunity to exploit humanity and so the lower breakaway civilization is um exploitive the way i've described it in my work is i call one the antichrist impulse and these these people actually have a completely different energetic system. Um, it's known as the beast system, um, and they have a completely different timeline, a completely different trajectory. And um, the higher breakaway civilization is um, what would be linked to the Christ impulse um, or the Christ stream, and this is the initiating stream for humanity. So these individuals have earned their position there through going through initiations just like this. And they seek to help humanity. Um, these are the people that would we that we would consider ascended masters or very advanced adepts, people even that are incarnated, people that are not incarnated, people that are on the earth, people that are in the earth. Um, um, but it's a whole system. It's a whole system of... Um, of a advanced positive breakaway civilization, um, and this the the positive breakaway civilization. Um, if you really look at the technology, it's actually a little bit different than the lower breakaway civilization. Um, the lower breakaway civilization got their technology from basically beings that are significantly lower in consciousness um, than the. Um, higher breakaway civilization, which is a uh, technology that basically can directly interface with your mind, your emotion, and your spirit in a much more succinct way. Mm -hmm. Whereas the lower breakaway civilization cannot interface with the technology as closely. They can't control it as well. It's a lot more synthetic. So lower breakaway civilization has extremely dirty technology compared to the um, higher breakaway civilization, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because I was thinking about how um, Steiner was talking about in the ancient Mayan culture, you had the priests that could get all this information from these harmonic entities who were yeah. not physical. And they would go into the state and receive that information and then be able to implement it. And it it is a kind of fantastic information, but it's kind of like, um, you know, the types of entities would be like the kind of Aleister Crowley type contacts, you know, the lamb. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You do start getting into 
um, the conversations about the grays. Um, and uh, you start getting into a, a split in the temple cultures or, or the mystery schools where over time there's been so much splitting that has occurred where certain people have gone into this lower negative impulse and and certain people have gone into the higher one and maintained that. And so there's people that have this incredible knowledge because they've been introduced to various um, mystery teachings and you know, they're part of it. They have access to it. They can have these seances. They can build things. They can do things. They have the same information that anybody else does, but just not the same capacity. Um, and this is really what generates and feeds that lower breakaway civilization. Um, one of the things that's very interesting about the lower breakaway civilization is that um, the grays, what, what we know as the grays, and I, I call them divergent timeline. It's a divergent timeline. The eighth sphere is a di divergent timeline, really. Um, and so they were communicating with people and posing as saviors. And they were they were trying to appear environmental as, saviors. Yeah, yeah. Wow, incredible. And uh, like and um and and then they gave them formulas to develop technology in exchange for access to humanity. It's a very um, intriguing story. It's yeah. What is it? Um, you study the alien aspect a lot. You're very in touch with uh, a lot of these aspects. How do you see the grays, you know, we know that the Pleiadians seem to have this spiritual tie in with humanity's past, but the grays are unusual again. The grays are, the grays are a future version of humanity that decided to take on transhumanism and become transhumanists and deformed themselves to the point that there was no return. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of different, it's a long story and there's lots of details to this, but that's like the long story short. Um, the, the, the Pleiadian or sometimes Venusian, um, uh, they're just superhuman. There's no divergent. These are people, the, the, these are beings who have passed the initiation. They never deformed themselves. They never mutated themselves with technology. And so you can't even tell that they've advanced themselves unless you can, you know, see their aura. They may be look a little bit different, but at the end of the day, they're human. They're, they're just superhuman. Something that we can all do. Something that every single person can do and achieve should they take on the mantle of it. You know, um, that, so there's that superhuman element. And then there's the divergent timeline, which is what we know as the grays and there's other divergent timelines too, but the most significant one to us is really the grays um, because they really are basically humanity. They're a failed humanity that failed so badly. They, they failed the initiation that we face now so badly that they had to come back to our time and they do have these technologies, right? Um, and try to take genetics from this time to try to give themselves a body that they could actually start to incarnate into again. And so it's so it's it's beautiful how the universe does this, how during our initiation time we will be confronted with both. We will be confronted with superhumans that have achieved. You may not even know who they are. They won't tell you, they probably won't talk about it. Right. And then there will be, you know, and but and then we'll also be confronted with this idea of a failed humanity that we have to look right at because we're looking right at our own choice, our own initiation. Wow, that's really true. Uh, so many of the leaders today seem that they're on this backward, twisted path. You know, Musk and Zuckerberg and um, Jack Dorsey at Twitter. Uh, you know, obsessed with control, controlling free speech. In Musk's case, he talked about this big breakthrough where he was running electrodes through a monkey's brain to get reactions and just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Uh, and th this guy, you know, really not playing with the full deck. Um, <laughs> so we kind of, we, we didn't get the leaders on the public front that we could say, hey, you know, like you could in the 1960s, you look at 
JFK and MLK and RFK and be like, I want to be moving the culture the way these guys are moving the culture and the space program and everything else. Uh, and even a lot of movie directors and things in that period, there's an idealism that comes out of it. We come into the 2020s and it's interesting because it's almost like the outer culture now isn't leading. It's leading us into the dark doorway, but it's the people on the surface who it, it's almost like an inversion because the people on the surface have the ability and they still have the consciousness. They haven't been corrupted by this larger thing. And uh, I mean, to some degree, they haven't been corrupted by it. So they have the ability now to band together. That's what I've been getting from a lot of your work, which is people seem to have the ability to build a new civilization. Yes, we absolutely do. Just with our choices every single day, you know, we have the ability to come together and and, and build something. You know, if we keep feeding the system the way it is, it's never going to change, whether it's right. criticism or whether it's you know, praise or whatever it is, we keep playing into it. It's not going to change. We have to do something ourselves. We have to go inward in a spiritual sense, but also, but also in practical senses, like with, um, you know, finding that food source that, you know, you were talking about earlier, um, securing shopping at small businesses. We have to start actually doing the practical things with the spiritual things, and that will transform society so fast not only that it'll be so healing because honestly even before this happened there were so many people that were lost and depressed i mean we're seeing all this come to the forefront now but this has been going on for a long time a lot yes. of people have yeah so this is it's a good that this is kind of happening in a way because now we're getting a lot of validations and we can kind of turn a corner and, and really start letting some things go really start changing our mind really, really start changing things it's interesting. Um, there were movements in the seventies for things, you know, uh, for example, uh, anti-pollution, you know, don't litter. And, um, there were all kinds of sustainability arguments back then, you know, uh, don't let the corporations use things that'll <laughs> deplete the <laughs> Well, all that's these arguments, <laughs> All these arguments went out the window, uh, eventually when the corporations took over things like Netflix and they get you think what activism is, is just something that you can be outraged by. So you're emotionally invested in some little thing, you know, they could say like, oh, take down the picture of this guy that is in this remote little capital building in Georgia. And that'll be, that'll show what a great person you are. And these people get obsessed with it. And they're like, it needs to happen. His picture from the Georgia Capitol needs to come down. Um, these types of things. Right. Yeah. What do you, that is a, a kind of neurosis. It doesn't have anything to do with evolving a society. No, it's, it's, it's kind of like, now that you're putting it that way, it kind of reminds me of like the 1984 where they just go like yell at the screen for, two minutes eight, screen yes. for like 20 minutes. And I just feel so much better now. <laughs> you know, it's so totally like this, this game that you're playing with yourself to relieve an inner pressure that you, have but you're not actually changing anything you're not actually getting anything done um and um it is it is a it is a neurosis but but some people are catching on um and i think that we just need to kind of reach a little bit of a critical mass a lot of people who do talk about it get censored that doesn't help you know yeah. the, the oh, yeah. thing is a lot of people just aren't leaders a lot of people, I think, genuinely would channel their energy in the correct way, um, but they're just not leaders in the sense of um, having that capacity. We, and all, all the politicians have been for so long, we've made it so the leadership is so um, self-serving and wimpy that we don't have leaders leading us in the right way. Um, but I do feel like if, if people... I do feel like people would if they had the right exposure to it. Yes, absolutely. I, um, you know, it's interesting because Putin came out and was talking recently and he's had some very unusual things to say, but one of the odd things he said was that, Oh, we need to find things in common in society or else we're going to head for a war of all against all. Now we know who said that. Yeah. So this is a Steiner quote direct yeah. from Putin. 
And it just went over everybody's head because whatever. But of course, there I am sitting, <laughs> reading it and thinking, oh, he's a Rudolf Steiner reader. That's interesting. Yeah, uh, that is really interesting. Um, he's right. Whoever said it, they both are right. You know, yes. we're seeing things devolve into that very quickly with, you know, every every race is turning against each other and nothing's getting done. We don't know how to work out real problems the right way, you know? Um, well, it's interesting because in the Steiner um, vision of things, Armand's very divisive and his, his ultimate goal and what happens is the right side of the human body turns against the left side of the human body. Wow. So this is where we can see this development. You know, when they take you back to the 1960s and they say, you know, oh, you know, racial justice, you know, we need to have these things as if it had never been talked about or done it as if there wasn't affirmative action of the civil rights movement or all these things to move the culture forward. And there's always a long way to go, but obviously the culture is already on that track to pretend that, you know, you're in the mid sixties and you have to blow up cities to get attention and money. Uh, these things are obviously engineered and oh. they've been doing these types of things. Those groups are incredibly destructive. That group um, loves the idea of civil war, for example, because it's more of this division, like we're talking about the war of all against all. Well, those people are already have their right side turned against their left side within them. Right. And so they look out in the world and that's all they see. That's they, they, they're already, they've already lost the war. Yeah. All against all. They're already in it. That's all they can see. That's all they can know. Um, but we have to start trying to bring some sobriety back into, into the fever dream that we're all living in. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I won't dwell on politics here. I just want to mention that thinking about these kind of harmonic influences in society on the rise, the transhumanist push for things to make the society less human, as you said, kind of um, creating this idea that there's an alien ideal that's better than humanity. And this sort of clean super chip can make you super ready for this alien thing. Because during the whole lockdown, what is it that they've been pushing even sometimes with very outdated stories, pretending that they're brand new, they've been pushing this weird version of the UFO thing. Yes. It's so strange for us who have been on top of the subject for years and knew when the media hated to talk about UFOs. They couldn't stand it. They would block every story and ridicule anybody who was involved with it. Now, GG, they love it. They love it. Um they keep sprinkling it in every once in a while to make sure it's in the forefront of people's minds. Yes. I do sense that they are having a difficulty with it though. I yeah. do. I, yeah. I do sense that when they do do things, there's a sense of it being beyond them. I do think it's the hardest card that they're going to play. It's going to be the hardest thing that I think they do much harder than doing the, the, the virus stuff or anything else. This is the really hard one because they, they have a really hard time um, dealing with it because it directly deals with consciousness. And there is such a community that there is actually a pretty huge alternative community that shoots it down right away a lot of the time. Yeah. So you do see them trying and they are going to continue to try. They are going to continue to do it. I have no, no doubts, but um, I do feel like it's something that really is hard for them. There's, right. something, there's something about it that they're not really able to. Well, I have a kind of a popular <laughs> phrase that I use, which is if you think the coronavirus uh, op was hardcore, wait till they get to the alien op because that's really what they're building up here. And oh. it's in, they already have a UAP task force. They already have the idea of a UFO threat out there. They promoted it through GTSA, which is bombing, you know, because their, their TV show went down the drain and, um, they have a hard time. Yes. It's interesting too, because they did have a hard time pushing it, even though, 
um, a lot of people in the field of UFOs actually jumped on board and, and tried to be a part of that thing, it really didn't go anywhere. And um, they were using the threat idea again. And they were, it was the whole idea of here are the heroes, the CIA, and here's the threat, evil aliens. <laughs> yes. And it's uh it's the same thing again and again. And that may actually be why they're having such a problem um, is because they are so militaristic about it and they do all, they, they always take the military approach. Yes. Um, and they, it's a very masculine, very heavy masculine approach. It's not satisfying for a lot of people. It's not a satisfying narrative for a lot of people um, to think about space in that way. And, and it's, it's just instinctively it's wrong. And I don't know, I don't think they realize that it's that, that it, it's just the wrong way. And I don't think they have the capacity to do it the right way. Um, they really have developed an entire structure um, outside of earth and underneath the earth. <laughs> yeah. uh, as covered on your show before, um, including probably Mars. Um, and they have a lot of technology that they've kind of squirreled away they want to use it. They, they want to become spacefaring. They have all these toys. They've developed this infrastructure. They want right. to use it. And they want to fill it with probably recruiting people. Um, and they just want to get it going. I'm sure that they, they're living in a, one of the things that, you know, spirit showed me was that the consciousness of these people that are behind this is like they're living in a completely different reality than the average person, completely different technology, completely different level of knowledge because they've developed it for power for so long privately that it's actually hard to function at this point because they're so far ahead in, in the worlds that they're creating or what they're doing. So they have to bring earth up to, they have to bring humanity up to, up to their speed and they're hoping to do it in a way that supplants the culture that we naturally have. But they got to use that. <laughs> yes. You know, it's interesting to me um, in the mystery school tradition, in the Casey work in Steiner's work, they talk about the planets as developmental pathways, almost like school rooms that we pass through. And then we go through these phases of lives on these planets not as physical life, but as different types of life, etheric form. Density, different density. Different density, right, exactly. And then we come back to fulfill those lessons in a physical body here. Uh, you know, Casey talked about Arcturus being the doorway out of this system. Um, and we hear about that too, which is you've mastered the system, you've moved on. This idea of virtual reality and technology being set up as the eighth sphere by Armon to become an artificial step. Um, if that those steps are interrupted, what happens to humanity and what happens to the normal, say, reincarnation chain that takes place? Well, two very well it well, I mean, that stream would become very different over time. Then, the, then, you know, if you if you want to call the one stream new Jupiter or higher Earth, you know, the lower one is going to be completely different over a long over a period of time than the other one. They're going to they're going to be totally deformed um, in every way. What happens is um, they end up pouring energy into the, the lower chakra system or like the beast lower chakras, and it ends up completely changing their consciousness. And um, that's why a whole different sphere has to be formed. Uh, Steiner, Steiner says uh, the spirits of form come down, you know, at the end of the cycle, and they kind of pressurize it into a separate sphere. So the, the spirits of form are like, what I think he means is they're bringing form to all of the thoughts that we think and all of the immaterial. It's kind of coming down and, and, and making a world out of everything that we've invested in over our lives and if it's divergent if it's not holy if it's not out of love and the spirits of form compress that into that eighth sphere and that's that synthetic sphere that false sphere and so that world is going to be a world of 
basically trauma and what you haven't worked on, it'll be denser than this world, than this world that we have now, even adding, even adding, um, these kind of transhumanist parts to the brain will change your bioenergetic frequency so that it's no longer sovereign. That's going to change your, your, the way that everything about you functions as it is. So we're probably looking at a weird hive mind. Can you imagine falling from the density that we are now losing your sovereignty? So like you can't even think it reminds me of that, that Vonnegut poem about the ballerina and they have the thing on and the thing buzzes when you think the wrong thing. <laughs> yes. that, that, it's like that. It's, I mean, it's very prophetic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's going to be like a hive mind, a group mind. You'll have no sovereignty. And that is very, like, we think it's hard now to ascend. Or we think it's hard now to connect with our heart and our higher self. Because we're already so disconnected by the overuse of our mind. Well, think about that. Think about if you take that divergent stream even further. Think about losing your ability to even think for yourself. That is what we're looking at. We're looking at the loss of sovereignty. And in order for them to begin to kind of climb back up the evolutionary train, they have to climb back up to where we are now. Right. This is a this is above. So that's why there's that whole thing about beings harvesting our DNA and abductions and things like that is because we're actually when when, when it comes to the evolutionary streams, we are above that sphere. So they have Absolutely. to evolve back up to where they fell. So do you think so this is really interesting actually because um what do you think if we look at it and say, well, the mystery schools left behind a kind of a blueprint and they said you know here's what you can discover and here's what's coming uh going so far you know in theosophy they say in the 21st century you know the world teacher uh, has to appear in and the sixth root race you know who is a psychic race is coming and then Steiner's work comes forward as, as kind of a correction to that since he came out of theosophy and he says actually we're past the point of the world teacher and we're past the point of Mahatma's um, rescuing us. We're, we're actually taking it on with true spiritual science as individuals with their help, you know, but we're not waiting for them to deliver us. That's why. And it's odd because Krishnamurti who came out of the theosophical training and they trained him to be that world teacher. He said what Steiner said in essence, which is no humanity's moved past this. But theosophy had that interesting setup and what they were trying to tell us about the 21st century, whether it's Steiner's work or Gurdjieff's work or theosophy, is that this is where it all converges. This is where the challenge is. And Gigi, they point right to this uh, period that we're in. Yes, they they really do. And, you know, it, it, it reminds me of what... Um, Steiner said about Christ is some people think that the man will sort of reincarnate. And he said, no, the consciousness, right? Consciousness. So we do go through these periods where it's very much about an individual initiator and the individual initiator is personifying a very precise force in the cosmos and contributing that to humanity, which is very important. Certain pathways, certain circuitry materializing that we can look at Christ and see that he did that. But then we also go through periods where it's not about that individual force so much personifying. It's really about that force expanding into the cosmos and connecting with it yourself and becoming that yourself, individualizing that yourself. <laughs> that was the whole point of the avatar. That was the whole point of the great teacher was to do that yourself. But we have this desire to, I think, sometimes not read the energy as it is but to read it as it was. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why um, Steiner ended up sobering theosophy in that way a little bit. It's beautiful, you know, you can't knock it, but did sober it a little bit because I think he was reading things as it was. Is that masculine presence to read it as it is, not the dream, you know, but read it as it is, you know? And so that's what I think, that's the difference in, in, um, in I think the two, um, and the, the the reason why it's here now 
is because we're right on that precipice where this is the time where things really start speeding up. They really, really start splitting. Um, it can be an incredibly productive time in our life if we can understand exactly what this is, which is a time of purging and rearranging um, and starting to live very exact, um, very efficiently. Um, but we can also see that there's a lot of different interdimensionals that have come here at this time. And that's part of this as well, is because this time is very, very, very significant. Um, because when you look at the predictions for some of the pro the programs that Elon Musk is doing, the, you know, the ones that we love so much, you know, Neuralink and SpaceX and stuff like that, um, ma ma like Mars colonization, we are looking at a completely different world in potentially even 30 years. We are looking at um, a different planet being colonized. We are looking at um, potentially people being hooked up to the Borg. Um, wow. We are looking at, we are looking right at the, an opportunity where consciousness could completely change and life on earth could completely change so fast. And so I think that that's why this time was so prophesied about, because if you were a psychic, you would be like, this is where I've got to put the awareness. This is where we got to put the energy because this is where the biggest shift is. And this is where the most critical time is because if like, I mean, some of it is like hooking people up um, to things like Neuralink or, or various weird, um, you know, various weird nanite technology, even in the next five or 10 years. We're right here. We don't realize it because we don't we, we don't connect with our energy and our aura and stuff like that normally. So we don't realize that these things change your consciousness. So. Wow. Yes, absolutely. And it makes you more part of their system. They're trying to, in essence, plug average people into their system. And uh, this is the group of transhumanist leadership that's, in essence, taken over. Um, you know, Gates, Musk, these types of people are, um, you know, and Gates being really one of the worst, just, you know, gleefully can't wait till the next pandemic. He's already talking about how he's got systems ready to uh, uh, vaccinate a quarter of the population against the next pandemic, you know, and he just is waiting for these little updates. Um, pandemics are actually extremely rare. <laughs> and the idea that you just line up expecting them uh, to hit, you know, it seems very strange and completely contrived to pour humanity into this very, um, I mean, it's a robotics system ultimately, which is, this is where they're going. And, um, so they're trying to get the human on par with the robot and using AI as part of it. That is an interruption in soul evolution. Oh. Because, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it is, it is the biggest, it is the biggest. And you know what? In all true style, it'll be sold and promoted as the best possible thing. It'll be sold as though you're superhuman. Right. And it'll be sold as though you can regenerate you know, your spinal cord, or you can, you can do all this stuff and, and they'll sell it as though it's this miraculous technology. And I think that's the crazy part of it all is that a lot of people will go for that because it's a com complete inversion of, of reality where you'll think that you're getting something that's actually going to make you better. But in the long run, it's separating you from the most precious thing that you have, which is your soul. And those people that end up being more soul directed, um, what kind of a, a civilization are they looking at building when this whole system is on top of them in a sense? Well, I think that we're going to move a lot more towards organic living. Um, I think we're going to move out of these big cities because we realize that living in concrete and steel is really not um, very, we realize that a lot of our ancient ancestors technology, even if it's stone or even if it's, you know, crystals was a lot more advanced than the stuff that we're doing in cities. 
Um, and we're, so we're going to see people moving more towards, I think, the way we used to do things and finding that balance between um, we're already seeing a lot of people moving towards traditionalism um, and revamping that. You're seeing a lot of that. Now, I'm seeing a lot of that now. People homesteading, people farming, um, and it's it's changing their lives because they're realizing that the way that we live today is very much against nature in a lot of ways. You know, we're going to see smaller communities. That's what it's going to look like is smaller, more meaningful communities, um, real connection. Um, and these will be people who are willing to um, basically say goodbye or sacrifice a lot of the materialist notions and desires that they had. Um, the people who are more materially oriented will have a lot more difficult time with it. Um, but over time, the more organic society will be stronger. They will be stronger, probably be anti, I probably won't do a lot with vaccines, organic food, water. We're going to move back to a lot of the knowledge that our ancestors had that we sort of foolishly forgot about. Right, right, absolutely. Um, a return to the land in a lot of ways. Yeah, and um, really getting into our understanding also, I think, of um, our kundalini energy and um, seeing that as a great achievement. You know, a good example of how humanity could be is the Essenes and the various or the higher breakaway civilization cultures, how they live is, you know, where the most important thing is the development of the, of the spirit within the body. Um, and uh, some thing that you take with you when you die. It's the thing that we should all be the most, um, the most careful with and caring about the most, because it's the one thing that survives this reality. Absolutely. Um, how, so that takes shape basically through kind of uh, recognition of these intentional communities. Uh, yeah, I would say so. And it may not be, it may be like certain towns that just end up attracting to them, you know? Yes. Yeah. It may not be like, you know, some of the intentional communities that I've seen in, in the spiritual community where it's around one spiritual figure um, that they worship and they sort of serve. It's more like, um, an intentional community based around an idea or more of that than like a person sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, Fitz has talked about them developing local currencies, mm, yep. uh, local food systems and things of that nature. Um, I see that. so there's some people that have that, that do that already. There's some communities yeah. that are already, yeah. Barter and, but this is how you see them kind of branching off and saying, I'm not plugged into that system. You know, I'm not plugged into Bank of America. <laughs> yeah. It's not um, worth it. There's going to be people that are like, it's not worth it. It's like you with your Twitter. If they're going to force you to, if they're already stealing your data, if they're already disrespecting people by removing them from social media, they're taking your phone number. I mean, it's just how many acts of complete and outright disrespect do we take before we just say, you can have it. I'm going to do something else now <laughs> because right. I don't want to in engage in, and yeah. um, I won't be treated this way, you know? So people will begin to do that the more that the fist comes down. And it's amazing. Twitter being like one of the worst offenders. Uh, and we've seen them do it to so many different people from forbidden knowledge, TV to fits uh, but they did it to me. They took away 10,000 followers first, and then they locked me out of the account. But um, what I did and uh, <laughs> what you're going to be doing is jumping into Telegram. And um, it's interesting because it, it's going to become a competition of free sources. Just like at a certain point, I think it's going to become a competition of free states mm. versus these crazy dictator states. And, uh, you know, I like the idea of the union, <laughs> don't get me wrong. And I'm sure there are forces set up to create civil war style scenarios, but, um, there's no question that there's going to be a certain point where people who are sensible are going to say, 
I want to go to a free state, you know, where they don't force all these ridiculous lockdown rules, where they don't destroy small business and where they're not completely under the thumb of the new world order. It, it already is happening. And we're seeing that shift from California uh, to Florida, you know, and you've seen it already from New York to North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've already seen it, um, these huge migration waves going from places uh, into Arizona, for example. Mm-hmm. So, you know, places that seem more free, Texas, um, they have their problems, but their fundamental identification with American freedom is not in question the way it is in a place like California, which is basically run like a dictatorship. Uh, And now even the people in California are trying to get Gavin Newsom recalled, which I think is a great idea. But behind Gavin Newsom is that engine, you know, it's that they're going to try to put another guy in there um, who will do the same thing. So it's very interesting what you're coming up with, which is that split is not so much a civil war style split. It's more of a, we're not part of your system and we're going our own way type split. Yeah. um, I mean, I could, with the last election, for example, you know, you're talking about a large portion of the population that, that is more populist by nature and wants nothing to do with this kind of Gates new world order. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people that can find themselves under just the rebellion against the system, even though they don't agree on a lot of things other than that. And that's what's really going to generate, um, to, to generate this. Um, one thing I think is also is important is that I don't really think we've seen the, the light forces or the, I don't think we've really seen any counter punching yet. I don't think we've seen the, I, I, I don't think that we've seen the response yet to a lot of the tyranny that's taken place. And when we see all of these populations now suddenly being concentrated in places like Texas, Florida, um, that are freedom oriented, suddenly they're going to be a lot more awake. They're going to be maybe around like-minded people. And that's going to start a sort of momentum that maybe didn't exist before. Um, And so we really have yet, we're kind of groggy. We're kind of waking up. We're trying to process this. We're trying to process what it all means. A lot of people were not prepared for this level of operation. Um, But we haven't really seen We haven't really seen people hitting back yet. We see like Rand Paul, we see certain people holding the line, certainly, but we haven't really seen um, on a civilian level and we haven't really quite seen the response yet, which I think will be a lot. um, You know, there's a vacuum right now in politics, a big vacuum in politics that needs to be filled. There's a whole lot of people that aren't represented right now. Oh, yeah. And that's going to be a great opportunity for some people, someone to come in. And so we, 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 we have a lot of, there's going to be a lot of things that move and um, we're just in the very beginning of it. And we haven't yet seen humanity start to rise yet. I mean, we're still waking up. We haven't yet. And I think the, the centralizing of, of, um, as, as you're saying, into these freedom-oriented states, I think that's going to really um, be kind of like the wind beneath. It's going to cause a lot of um, change. Absolutely. Yeah, no question about it. It's fascinating to be in the middle of the process, actually see it taking place. We've seen it happen in history before, but to actually be there when it's taking place is remarkable. We're dealing um, with a lot of weird stuff like lockdowns. And censorship on social media. So a lot of people are like, how is this going on? You know, how is all of this tyranny actually taking place? But in in reality, um, it's like we're being locked. We're under lockdown. People are censored. Groups on Facebook get deleted all the time of people trying to gather. So we do have a lot of stuff that we're up against that we have to realize um, um, and, and, and kind of factor in. But I think once we get our stride, we'll start to see a lot more movement. No question about it. And um, what's interesting to me is it seems like, you know, 
there is a kind of a mystical aspect to this as well. You know, it's like they foresaw this coming, um, those groups that we were referring to, the theosophists. Uh, in anthroposophy, they talk all about biodynamic farming, which is one of the more incredible um, farming methods that are available for developing organic foods. And so these things were laid out. Um, you know, the Gurdjieff Foundation and with Gurdjieff's work, a lot of the things that he said in relation to mystery schools is that what they are is they are, and he was speaking in terms of how they're not meant to be institutions over time, but they are groups of individuals that come together to move society, spread seeds Mm -hmm. uh, for future society and move back into the kind of, you know, mystical underpinnings where we don't <laughs> see them again. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're not meant to be there. It's like, Hey, it's mystery school 101. I'm going to walk in and, and everything's going to be hunky dory. They get together, they come together in sometimes fantastical ways. Um, and usually through remarkable individuals and, um, but they don't, they don't um, tend to stay in the same form very long. So I think that's what we're looking at now, which is they laid the foundation for us. The books are out there. People have been in groups for years. You know, I talked to someone who was in a Steiner group from the 1960s, wow. um, you know, and so, you know, this thing has been going on for a long time. Of course, the Gurdjieff groups started in 1915, you know, soon to be into the Russian uh, revolution period. So it is, I mean, it's a long journey for this work. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been there's a whole lineage of, you know, people that have come and um, read the energy and, and tried to prepare humanity for this time. But it, it's all here. Right. It's all here. That's the funny thing about all of this is is it's it's literally a, 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 if you want the information, the structure, it is literally a click away. Right. It's here. It's all here. There's no lack of information. And the information that is brought forward by these teachers, it is done in such a way that no matter what consciousness level you're on, you will get something different from it. Um, and you will get what you need. It's transcendental. It's a transcendental style of writing and of teaching where there's energy embedded in it. So um, it's meant to work with your consciousness. There's spirit in it. And so you just have to engross yourself in it. You just have to start. You just have to start. Even if you don't understand what's being said, you just have to engage with the material, just have a relationship with the material. Half of them, I mean, I've been in this for a while, long enough, and half <laughs> of some of the stuff I read, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> but then you'll have to start having dreams or you'll, a, a book will fall off the shelf about something else, or you'll just get it one day. And this is the nature of the work, is that it's beyond how you would read a newspaper. You have to just have a relationship. You just work with it, and it will work on you. And that's really what this is all about. It's that, um, that's really what's been left behind. It's more than a teaching. It's a culture. Um, it's a way of being, and it's, um, it's multidimensional so that it will work it will work with you and that's something that i think is really important that people know if you're new to it is is that it's 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 a transcendental kind of thing incredible uh Gigi, remarkable work across the board you've been doing some amazing things i highly recommend this uh christ impulse lecture which you very generously provided online uh and it's over three hours which <laughs> uh it's it's a very uh fascinating work that you're doing and engaged in now where should people go to find out uh, more about what you're doing yeah so you can just head on down to ggyoung.com just my name and uh i have a premium site where i hang out with you just like this. I answer your questions. I do actually a live Q&A about um, every two weeks. It is every two weeks. And I go for three hours. And we just talk just whatever's on your mind, whatever questions you have. Um, I Fantastic. Also, yeah. I also have uh, courses and things like that if you want to develop your intuition. 
Um, and that's where you can find me, just ggyoung.com and YouTube. And maybe yes. Telegram. Yeah. <laughs> Telegram is coming. Uh, and I want to say in relation to that, that, uh, you know, I've known people have taken your uh, intuition courses and they are life changing for them. Uh, so just remarkable work there to explore for everyone. And of course, you've covered so many uh, of the issues from the alien work to Atlantis and Lemuria and the mystery schools, all in these videos that you've done over the course of, of a decade or so. Just incredible uh, background that you have there. And we will have you back, of course, on the X series. I, I'm fond of saying that the X series has no greater uh, friend or ally than Gigi Young. But uh, it's great to see you. Well, thank you for having me. Now I'm looking forward to seeing this split in society because it's a flowering of humanity as opposed to the civil war. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people may experience that, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can, energy is energy. You know, we have to remember that energy is energy and we can use it to compress us into our worst selves, a war of all against all, or we can, and, or, or we can use the same energy to discover the most incredible things about humanity, the things that we've been missing. Fantastic. Okay, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Amazing Gigi, and of course you can find her incredible work at gigiyoung.com. Just fascinating esoteric information from a true mystic. And remember to visit darkjournalist.com to sign up for our newsletter to learn about the fantastic shows that we have coming up for you. Remember to join us on Fridays for the X-Series. See you soon. <laughs>